Hi, this is Greg. Thanks for checking out this video. Recently, I invited Paul Thornton, a recognized leadership influencer, to come to my channel and discuss his latest book, The Leadership Process. Are you effective at each step in the leadership process? I've known Paul for over 20 years, and his entire career has been focused on management and leadership development. Paul is a prolific author, consultant, and trainer. He has presented numerous seminars and workshops. Paul is also a former professor of business administration. In today's video, we will discuss his latest book and share our thoughts on a number of leadership topics. I hope you enjoy it and let me know in the comments if you would like to see future videos like this interview. Here it is. Hi, I'm Greg Thomas and welcome to the Leadership Excellence website. Today, I am pleased to have a longtime acquaintance on uh, the Leadership Excellence site to interview him, to talk about his work, to talk about the things that he's done throughout his career, and perhaps some things that he's looking forward to in the future. Paul Thornton is someone whom I've known for over 20 years. Actually, I interviewed him in We Lead Online Magazine of February of 2002, over 20 years ago. That was the first time I came in contact with Paul, and also he provided a number of articles for uh, We Lead. Uh, the first one that I had record of was 2005, an article entitled Leadership, Seeing, Describing, and Pursuing What's Possible. So mm -hmm. Paul is an author, he is a consultant, a trainer, he presents seminars and workshops, he's a former professor of business administration, he writes almost daily on LinkedIn, so I encourage you to go to LinkedIn and search for his name and you'll locate him, he'd love to be able to, to spread his knowledge and his wisdom with as many people as possible. He also has 28 short YouTube videos on various topics, and perhaps he can tell us how to locate those. Those uh, were a little difficult for me to find, but uh, I'm delighted to welcome Paul Thornton mm -hmm. here today. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Greg. Thank you for that nice introduction. I'm pleased to be here. Uh, leadership is one of my favorite topics, and uh, you're right. I do a lot of writing about it. I've done speaking about it. I've done seminars and workshops. Uh, to me, it's a fascinating subject, and it's one that is hard to pin down precisely what leaders do. But uh, we're getting closer and closer, I think. But uh, it's a complex phenomenon and uh, exciting and challenging. So, again, thanks for having me. And I look forward to learning something and hopefully explaining a few things that I do and some of my views. Great. All right. Well, I want to begin by talking about your book. I got this on Amazon.com, and I believe uh, digital mm -hmm. downloads are also available. Uh, this is his book, The Leadership Process. Are you effective at each step of the leadership process? And like most of Paul's writings, he doesn't write 500 pages. He doesn't write war and peace. His books are very easy to read. They're uh, easy to follow, very informative, very helpful. I think this book here has like uh, 44 pages. So it's something you can enjoy in one sitting. And again, very informative. He encapsulates his years of experience and knowledge uh, in the leadership industry. He's definitely a leadership influencer and has been for many, many years. So Paul, let's begin in a nutshell. What is the leadership process? Well, before I get to that, I, yeah. I agree. I am trying to be very succinct and to the point in all of my books. When I was teaching principles of management, I got a book to review and the book had 800 pages in it to explain what it takes to be a manager. Um, I, I just, I couldn't really get through it. It was just too mm -hmm. much. And I try to cut out all the unnecessary stuff, get to the core, uh, the things that are really going to help people be more effective leaders and managers. So, so anyway, back to my book. Um, yeah. I think leadership is a process. I think there are four basic steps that leaders go through. And uh, in the book, I talk about each of those steps. So I'll go through them quickly. 
Uh, the first one is the leader needs to diagnose the situation, you know, diagnose the environment that they're in. Um, I don't see that mentioned in too many books, but I think that's a critical first step. Um, it's like a doctor diagnosing the patient, you know, what's going on. Uh, you got to look at the, all the factors, the hard data, the numbers, uh, how people are thinking and feeling, uh, what's going on in the external environment, the internal environment, the culture. All of those things kind of give you a sense of where are we today? You know, what's going on today? So that's step one. Step two is identifying opportunities. Leaders are focused on change. They're focused on improving the status quo. They want to make things better. So they're always looking at how can we improve? You know, what can we change? Can we change the process? Can we change the policy? Can we change uh, the structure? Um, all those things are evaluated and leaders come up with some number of things that would make sense to change and improve the operation. The third step is how do you present that as a leader? How do you package your message in a way that's convincing and compelling to the people you need to convince? You know, what, what, art, what facts, what examples, what stories, how are you going to make your case? You, you really got to think that through and fine tune it and, uh, dry run it a number of times, and then get ready to, to convince the people that need to be convinced that this is a right step to improve the current operation. And then the fourth and final step is developing a plan and then implementing that plan to in fact improve the operation. Uh, sometimes people put together a team, a cross-functional team, uh, of people that are going to work together and come up with the plan. But you know, Greg, as well as I do, to change anything, you know, you need a plan of some sort, whether mm -hmm. you're going on a diet or you're trying to eat healthier or you're trying to, uh, you know, improve your tennis game, whatever. You need a plan. So what's the plan? Who's going to be involved? What are the key dates? What resources do you need? You know, there's a lot to it, but sure. basically you need a plan. So the book talks about those four steps. It also talks about some of the insights and, and information I've gained from other consultants and other leaders, and also observing others trying to go through these steps. You know, what's it like watching a leader when he's uh, presenting his compelling idea to the audience and what does he do well or not so well? So it's a lot of things I've learned over the years that I think might help people in doing each step. So that's kind of what that book is about. Okay. Well, you've written, I think, about 17 books and over mm -hmm. 100 articles in various publications, magazines, journals. So what inspired you to write this book at this time? Um, that's a good question. I, I like writing. I try to write every day something. Sometimes it's just a sentence or two, but I, I, I like writing. Um, I think writing helps me clarify my thinking. When I can put it down on paper and look at it and critique it, I can decide whether it's clear or whether I need to, you know, revise something. Um, and thirdly, as I said before, I'm really motivated to try to simplify what leaders and managers do to make a difference. So I'm, I'm a big believer, the simpler you can mm -hmm. make it, the better. You know, short and simple. Yeah, yeah. I like so that. So that's, that's kind of what, why I wrote the book. Great. I'm always yeah. working on something. You know, I got to think <laughs> about what's my next book. <laughs> well, good. You have a very fertile mind. So yeah. uh, while we're at it, what is your next book? What's next on, uh, after 17 books and 100 articles, what's next on the agenda? Well, that's a good question. One, one thing I've always wanted to do and I've uh, thought about is creating a picture book that the picture tells the complete story about what managers and leaders need to do. Um, the challenge there is finding a picture that is so simple and clear, but yet makes an important point 
you know, regarding delegating or communicating or I don't know, whatever might be alignment. Um, so that's kind of in the back of my mind. I've come across some pictures that I think might be appropriate, uh, but it's almost like a, a picture book for kids, for young kids that would uh -huh. help them get the idea of what a leader needs to do and how a leader needs to behave, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of in the back of my mind anyway. Sure. Okay. Well, as you know, some people are visual learners like that, and it mm, may appeal right. to them. If I recall correctly, I think the one minute manager was a parable. So some mm. people just learn better mm -hmm. that way visually. So you might, yeah. uh, you might be onto something. And regarding yeah. it, you know, commented uh, being a concise writer and writing books clearly, mm -hmm. uh, I think of just my personal experience with the late Dr. Covey's The Eighth Habit. Uh, almost everyone I know went out and bought The Eighth Habit, and it was a huge book, but I know mm -hmm. very few people that ever finished it. Uh, they mm -hmm. started it enthusiastically, mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. it just the way it was written, and it went on and on and on, and it bounced around from here to there. A lot of people lost interest mm -hmm. because it was not concise. It mm -hmm. was not written clearly, and um, mm -hmm. so those are the pitfalls of uh, large books, I guess. Yeah, it's kind of like, I know, I remember his first book, The Seven Habits, was on a roughly 300 pages, and his Eighth Habit, which was a separate book, was also about 300 pages. So yeah, I yeah. was thinking, like, why does it take you 800 pages, uh, 300 <laughs> pages to write about one habit when you covered seven habits in 300 pages? You know what I mean? <laughs> sure, um, I do. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So along with the leadership process, you've obviously written other books and you've written about a lot of things. And one of them that I wanted to ask you about are the three styles of managing and leading. And then another yeah. publication was, I think, leading change. So mm -hmm. first, let's talk about the three styles of uh, managing and leading. Uh, mm -hmm. You believe there are three basic leadership styles. Can you define mm -hmm. those for us and tell I us do. the difference between them? Yeah, I do. And before, actually, before I get to, to that, let me just yeah. differentiate manager leader. I know there's, there's a lot Thank of you. articles and stuff you've sure. seen on that. Um, you're familiar with it, but some people in your audience maybe are, I don't know, not as familiar as maybe all the stuff we've seen on it. But for me anyway, a manager is someone who operates within the current environment, current procedures, current processes, current methods, you know, they're, they're using the current system to get things done. Leaders, on the other hand, focus on change. They want to change something. They want to improve something. So depending on whether I'm talking about a management style or a leadership style, it depends on what the goal is at the time. Okay, so that's the way I differentiate the two. But basically, I think there are three basic styles in there. They all start with the letter D, directing, discussing, and delegating. And I think managers and leaders use all three styles, you know, all the time. Almost every day, they use all three. Directing style, you're simply telling the person what to do, how to do it, when to have it done by you, the manager leader, are doing the talking and hopefully, you know, they're doing the listening and understanding what you want done. Um, the person learns when you use a directing style, they learn by doing, you know, they're following your directions. They learn how to be good listeners, I suppose, and then they learn how to carry out your instructions as you indicated it needs to be done. Um, you reward and recognize people with this style when they do exactly what you wanted them to do, right? That makes you happy, mm -hmm. right? Right. The discussing style is where you simply ask questions, right? You involve the person or the team by asking them questions like, you know, what do you think the goal should be? What do you think our plan should be? What do you see as the obstacles or what do you see as the advantages and disadvantages? So you're involving them, you're getting their thoughts, their ideas on the issue you're dealing with at the time. 
Um, here, they're learning to express their ideas clearly and succinctly. They're also learning that they got to back up their ideas. They just can't have a, you know, idea that our goal should be a 80% increase in sales. And they say, well, what is that based on? You know, well, I don't know. I just thought it should be that high, you know? Mm -hmm. So they're learning. And um, here again, as a manager leader, uh, you want to recognize and reward people when they contribute, when they build on the ideas of others, when they listen well, things like that. And then the third one is delegating. There's been a lot written on delegating. Um, as a style, you're empowering the person to take action, to solve the problem on their own, uh, to get it done. You want them to work independently to, to do whatever is needed to achieve the goal and complete the task uh, as you want it. And when you use that stuff, people are learning, of course, by doing, you know, they're, they're out there, sure. they're doing stuff day to day, and they're dealing with issues, and they're trying to influence people, and, you know, they're negotiating, and they're doing all that stuff. So there's a learning, a lot of learning going on as well in that style. So each style has a time and place. There's, there's no one best style, you know, I mean, it's like raising kids. It's, at times, we need to be direct. We need to tell the child what to do or what not to do. Other times, we discuss with our adolescent teenager, you know, what do you think? What do you see as the options, et cetera? And then when our kids get a little bit older, we delegate. We want them to run their own lives and make their own decisions, and we're there to help and assist, but we want them to take the ball and run with it and, you know, don't call Absolutely. me every five minutes and say, what should I do? <laughs> sure. So anyway, I think those are three styles that, again, managers and leaders use all the time, and they got to be good at it. They got to know when to use each style. I find some managers and leaders uh, gravitate more towards the directing style you know, they think that's what a manager leader needs to do. They don't engage people too much with questions or delegation. Is they, they do a lot of directing. And as I said, that has a time and place, but there's a lot of other times when discussing and delegating would be much more effective. So you got to kind of figure out what makes sense, what would be most appropriate for the situation you're dealing with, and then go from there. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree with you. Obviously, our we have our culture's roots in an autocratic environment. So I think for most people, directing, telling, mm -hmm. <laughs> is something yeah. that comes most natural to uh, yeah. both managers and leaders because of our culture. That's for sure. Yeah. I I grew up in a household. My father was very much directing. You know, I mm -hmm. he would. I had three brothers, so we had four sons. He was very directing, but my mother was very much discussing. She always ah. wanted to, you know, what do you think? You know, how do you feel about this? And what sure. should we do here? So it was interesting seeing those two operate in their styles. And as I say, they used a style most of the time, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you've written another uh or have another discussion in articles and in a book on leading change. Yeah. I want to quote to you something that you say and then ask you to explain it. Uh, here's the quote. Okay. You state uh, in your book, Leading Change, quote, various studies have found that 60 to 70 percent of change initiatives don't produce the desired results. So mm -hmm. why is this percentage so high? And mm -hmm. what do you recommend in um, helping people to increase the change initiatives mm -hmm. in their organization. That's abysmally low. Yeah. I mean, that's just frightening. Yeah. No, I, I agree. It, it's, it's a very um, bad percentage of terms of the number of successful change initiatives that occur. Uh, it's not the result you want as a manager or a leader. Um, I think it, it comes down for me, and I've been involved with some major change initiatives, and I've seen this up close and personal, but 
I think a lot of times some very simple, basic questions aren't answered. And one of them is, the, the first basic question is, is, is who needs to change? You know, who exactly needs to change? Is it the middle managers? Is it all employees in the company? Is it the um, HR department? You know, you got to pinpoint exactly, first of all, who needs to change? That's number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, and this is the one that always got me, was what specific changes do they need to make? And again, that sounds pretty basic and, and easy, but I'll give you an example. Um, I was involved with a company and the uh, vice president of sales and marketing said to me, uh, I want our sales reps to be quote, world-class, okay, world-class. Mm -hmm. I want you to design a training and development program that will make them world-class, okay? So I said to him, I said, well, what does world-class mean? What does that look like? How do you want them to behave? You know, what, what do you want them to do that they're not doing today? Right. And believe it or not, he had no answers. <laughs> he had no clear definition of what he wanted. And he, I guess he was expecting me to tell him what world-class was. And I, I don't know what a world-class salesman or saleswoman does or doesn't do. So it fell apart. Um, I've heard senior leaders say things like, we need to have our organization be, be more entrepreneurial, or we need to be more customer focused, uh, things like that. And, and again, those are fine, but you need to follow it up with some specificity. What, what does that mean to be entrepreneurial? You know, what do you want your employees to start doing or stop doing? Mm -hmm. What do you want them to change day to day? So I think that's often lacking. And um, I've, I've been, like I say, the three or four major changes I've been involved with, you could not get a clear definition of the precise change that the senior person wanted to make. Believe, believe it or not, it's yeah. probably hard to believe, but it's mm -hmm. true. And then the third question is, are people capable are people able to change and are they motivated or willing to change? You know, if they're able to change, that's fine. That's good. If they're not able, then you need to provide some training and mentoring and development or whatever is needed to make them able. Mm -hmm. If they're not motivated or not willing, the question is, well, why? You know, what's, what's holding them back? Is their plate already filled with other projects and tasks and they really don't have any time? Are they stressed out because their workload is so heavy? Um, what, what can you do to make them more motivated to change? Do you need to change sure. some incentives or rewards or whatever? And then finally, again, getting back to the plan, you need to have a complete realistic, relevant plan that you're gonna put in place to make the change occur. And I think a lot of times on the team that you assemble, you gotta uh, include some people from the target group, that's the people who need to change in some way, they should be on the implementation team. Mm -hmm. And you need to have some people from the support group, those are the people who can support people make, to make the desired changes. So getting a good team together with a good project leader who's going to, you know, come up with a plan to make it all happen is critical as well. So I think, you know, again, those questions are very basic and simple, but sure. they need to be answered with specificity. And oftentimes they're not, you know, it's just as a vague, no, we need to change. We need to be more customer focused. And, you know, it, it sounds good, but what does it really mean? to the employee day to day. Yeah, absolutely. You, you make me chuckle a little bit with the yeah. uh, sales manager who uh, said he wanted to have world-class sales person. Yeah. I spent most of my yeah. career as a regional national sales manager. And uh, aside mm -hmm. from all the platitudes, and he probably read that phrase in a book somewhere, uh, mm -hmm. the bottom line is at the end of the month, they really want to know if the salesman hit their number. 
or not. So mm, mm, it, if yeah, you hit your right. number, you're a hero. <laughs> if you right. miss your number, you're a bum. So right, that's usually right. the way it just basically uh, yeah. boils down. Or, or hey, maybe, you're world, maybe you're yeah. world class if you exceed your number. You know? <laughs> there you go. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So let's go back yeah. to your undergraduate days at Ohio mm -hmm. University, I believe. Yep. You were very fortunate to have a class learning from the late Dr. Paul Hershey, who mm -hmm. uh, conceived the idea of situational leadership. And mm -hmm. um, so what about this class? So what kind of class was it and what kind of impact did it have in your life? It had a huge impact. Uh, he was the best teacher I had. It was a phenomenal class. He not only taught us the situational leadership model, but he practiced it in teaching the class. So for example, the first two to three weeks, he was very directing in class. He would lecture and we'd take notes and what have you. And then we moved into a more of a discussion type, um, I don't know, for two or three weeks again, we mm -hmm. had a lot of questions, a lot of small group discussions, so a lot of discussion. And then the last two weeks of the class was more delegation. He had us going out, observing other leaders and people coming on campus. And we had to write a paper about the type, their style and what they did and didn't do and what have you. But he was just phenomenal in terms of the clarity of his points and how effective he was at practicing, you know, what he was teaching us. So I to this day, I tried to take his style and approach. And when I became a teacher, I tried to, you know, emulate that mm -hmm. and use that in my classes. And I, I just can't say enough good things about him. He was a phenomenal teacher and leader and uh, made a big impact on my life. He, he really inspired me to study leadership and management and make it a lifelong journey to, to work at it. So. Sure. Yeah, great, great guy. Wonderful. So, Paul, in some of your writings, you mentioned the influence of playing hockey in mm -hmm. high school and college had on you, and it kind of sparked your interest in leadership uh, in a career and mm -hmm. coaching. Uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, the sport of hockey and how it sparked that interest in your life. Yeah, I played uh, high school hockey, and... Um, you know, I was on a team that we usually did okay, but we were never at the top of the league. You know, we were always kind of in the middle. Mm -hmm. And we had some good players on the team. And it got me wondering, you know, why aren't we one or two in the league? Year after year, we were like fourth or fifth place, that type of thing. There were like nine, ten teams in the league. And I concluded it had something to do with the coaching. I thought the coaches of these top teams were just exceptional. They always seemed to bring out the best in their players. And it got me wondering, you know, what, what are they doing differently than the average coaches? And same idea. When I went to college, I was on a team and we had some talented kids on the team. Mm -hmm. But again, our, our coach was not the best, nothing against the coach. But, you know, there were other coaches that were ahead of us in the league again. So again, it made me thinking about what is the coach doing differently? And as I was saying earlier, at that time, I was at Ohio University and had Dr. Paul Hersey's class. And a lot of the stuff he was teaching me um, made me start thinking about what do the great leaders and managers and coaches do differently than the not so good coaches, managers and leaders? So that kind of stimulated my interest in this whole field and motivated me to learn as much as I could about, you know, these three topics. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's fast forward now to your yeah. career as a professor of business management. What mm -hmm. did you learn through the process of being a professor? What did you learn about students or leadership or perhaps coaching students to uh, get excited about the topic and uh, mm -hmm. to understand the importance of it. Yeah, well, I would, I tried to make the point that 
uh, management and leadership are skills that you use in a multitude of professions as a parent, um, as a teacher, coach, team leader, project leader, um, fireman, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. policeman, that doesn't matter. You use these techniques daily. So it has wide applicability to a whole bunch of different areas of your life. Um, I also tried to get into the idea that there's a lot of ways that you can influence and inspire people to make positive changes in their life. You know, like one, set the example, set a good example. Mm -hmm. um, me as a teacher, I tried to always be prepared. I tried to always show up on time. I tried to be diligent in getting the papers and projects back to students quickly. You know, so modeling the desired value is really important. Um, you can influence and inspire people with the words you say to them, of course. Um, up, you got to be upbeat, you got to be positive, you got to be, uh, keep hope alive, but keep it realistic. You know, you can't be fake or phony, you, you got to keep it real. That was important. Um, serving people, trying to help them, asking them, what can I do to help you improve your game? Uh, sometimes in coaching or teaching, that was an important thing for me to do. You know, what can I do to help you? Mm -hmm. My job here is to help you. What can I do to make you a better hockey player or a better student or better whatever? So th those are some of the things I did as a teacher or coach um, and, and hopefully as a parent. I have two children and now I have five grandkids and I'm trying to teach them about leadership and they're sure. teaching me a lot about leadership as well. So it's an ongoing process of being both a student and a teacher. I think yeah. that's important to always maintain those two roles, you know? Sure. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So I've seen the pictures of uh, one of your grandchildren, I think your mm. son on LinkedIn. So mm. that's great. So mm. let's say someone's watching this program. They're 21, 22 years old, or maybe yeah. they're, they're 40 years old in mid-career in the business world. And this has got them excited about learning more about leadership. This discussion has sparked within them a desire mm -hmm. to know more about uh, leadership. Where would you tell them to begin? If someone came to you and said, I, I don't know anything about leadership and I sure would like to learn, it sounds really exciting. What would you encourage them to do and where to begin? I'd encourage them to buy all my books and read them. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. I like no, that. I, I, I would encourage, and there's a lot of literature out there, there's a lot of articles and magazines, mm -hmm. but I would say expose yourself to some, some people you admire also as a leader, observe them, study what they do, and identify one or two things you want to work on to show some leadership yourself. For example, you might be on a, a team, an athletic team. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe there's some opportunities for you to speak up a little bit more in the locker room or in team meetings and make your point. Say, say what you think the team needs to do to improve, you know. So take some baby steps to take some initiative. Um, maybe setting the example in some new way might be something you, you could do, too. So there's a lot of little things you can do to start your journey towards being a more effective leader or manager. Mm -hmm. And maybe read one of my books and see if that has any insights that might help you uh, along your way as well. Sure. Good. Yeah. I'd like to ask you an age old question. I, I get this question all the time. So I'm interested mm -hmm. in your perspective on it. A person says, I'm interested in leadership. I'm studying leadership. I try to demonstrate leadership, but my boss is just an, an autocratic crank and abuses me and doesn't treat people well and kind of contradicts everything that I'm trying to do. So help me. What should I do in that situation? I, um, I think there's 
with your boss, let's take your boss, first of all, mm-hmm. um, trying to influence someone who is very set in their ways mm-hmm. and locked into uh, their beliefs very strongly. It's hard to influence, but I think you can't tell them how to think or how to view things differently. So I think asking questions, trying to get them to be more curious. So probing their point of view or or asking them, well, why do you feel that way? What's behind it? What's the rationale? And then subtly saying, have you ever considered this or that? You know, putting your idea out there. Um, Dealing with tough bosses is not easy. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there's also other opportunities in your life to practice leadership. You have colleagues. You have uh, people maybe that report to you. You have family situations where you can exercise leadership. Um, So, you know. Try to engage in some leadership type activities there. See how it goes. Learn from the experience. Um, get better as you go along. You're not always going to have a bad boss your whole life. There's a lot of good <laughs> bosses out there that uh, you're going to love working with and they're going to help you grow and develop. So don't get discouraged. There's other bosses that will be a lot better for you in your career. Sure. Yeah. Oh, there's a saying that people don't leave companies, they leave bad bosses. Yeah, so, I think that's very true. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. So tell me about your um, impression of servant leadership, the term servant leadership. And so what does, um, from your perspective, what does it mean to you? Is it valuable? Is it important? Yeah, good question. Um I covered that when I I taught a course on leadership and that was one of the topics Mm -hmm. we covered. And I think the students were a little bit confused for me that they thought they had to be a servant, just a servant, whatever people ask, you serve them and just, you know, Mm -hmm. give them what they want. And I said, well, no, that's not the way I look at it anyway. I said, servant leader. Leader is important. Leaders have a vision of how to improve the status quo. Mm -hmm. So you always got to keep that in mind. You got to make that known that this is what we want to become. This will help us be perform at a higher level. This is what the team would look like if we did X, Y, Z. Then you're serving them. You're helping them achieve that goal. So what, what can I do to help you you know, improve and and support this goal and buy into this mission and that type of thing. So I think servant leader is an important concept, but the leadership part is really important to nail down first and then do the serving. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's kind of like if you just were a server, uh, if the person said, well, I want to be you know, I want to be a drug addict. I just want to take drugs. And, and my job of serving is, okay, well, I'll go out and get you some drugs and give you the drugs. Well, no, that's crazy. And that's irresponsible. Mm-hmm. I want to serve them to pursue a higher purpose, a better vision, a better future, sure. a better right. goal, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. So I think, I think that's what leaders do. I think they, they do help. And at times they direct and discuss, but other times they serve. They do whatever they can to help the person gain the confidence and the resources and the belief that they can achieve that desired goal. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to ask you one more question. We're going to circle all the way back to your book here, The Leadership Process. All Mm -hmm. right. And in chapter seven, you Mm -hmm. list a number of case studies Uh, to apply each of the steps of the leadership process, which you explained to Mm -hmm. us a little earlier. So can Mm -hmm. you recall one of the case studies that you found most interesting and and why you found it Um, interesting or helpful? Let me do a quick recap. Sure. Okay. Yeah, Yeah, I think the I think the one on implementing change is an interesting one. It had to do with a superintendent of schools who was trying to implement a new way of teaching. 
Okay. The teachers were using more of a directing style and he, he wanted them to use more of a discussing and delegating style. And it, it goes through the, as I talked about before, the questions that you need to answer to make that happen. And I, I think that's a simple, clear example of the each of those questions you need to answer to make sure that change is going to happen and be successful. So, sure. but I think all of the case studies were, were there to, they're somewhat simple, but I think they make the point of what you need to do as a leader. And I guess the only other one, the first case study is about a um, new principal of a school. He takes over. And the first thing he's got to do is diagnose the environment. Mm -hmm. you know, what's going on in this school? You, you can't right. go in day one and start making all sorts of changes. You got to find out what's going on. How, how are people performing? What are the teachers up to? How are the students' records and attendance? And you know, what, what are they getting done? So you got to get clear on where are we today before you think about where, we, where do we want to get to in the future? So I think that's an important case for that point as well. So those are two, but they're all, they're all uh, good in various ways. So I think they make a simple point mm -hmm. and uh, they're easy to, I don't know, read and digest. So. Good. So yeah. what's the best way for someone to see your 28 short YouTube videos? Videos. Okay. If you go on YouTube and you put my name in, Paul Thornton, T-H-O-R-N-T-O-N, and then put S-T-C-C, -C, they okay. should pop up. Great. Those two words, yeah. Good. Yeah. And if someone wants to contact you regarding uh, having you do some speaking or training or workshop, what's the best way for them to contact you, Paul? Uh, my email is pb. Thornton, T H O R N T O N, 67 at gmail.com. Great. That's probably the best way. Good. Okay. Well, again, I want to encourage everyone to uh, purchase Paul's book here. I got mine from Amazon.com, and I think it's also available as a digital download. Uh, I'm of a older generation, so I like to hold something in my hands, but uh, depending on your age and your preference, it's available both ways. So, Paul, thank you so much for uh, spending some time today and allowing me to ask you some questions, and thank you for your career, for being a leadership influencer for decades. Uh, you probably will never know how many students you taught that won't come back to you and tell you, but how many students you taught that your classes and your instruction had a profound influence on their lives and helped improve their leadership. It's just a, a big thank you to you for all that you have done mm -hmm. and for being a modern leadership influencer in so many ways. Uh, thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> thank you for that, uh, those nice words. And I appreciate the opportunity to be on your program. And uh, hopefully some people got a thought or an idea about what they can do to be a leader, be a leader and make a difference. I think that's an important thing for all of us to keep in mind. So keep that in mind. But thanks again, Greg. I really enjoyed it and appreciate you having me on. You betcha.